Thanks, Sam. Um, it's Gary Dunnett from National Parks Association in New South Wales. And I'd just like to um, welcome everybody to MPA's first webinar of 2022. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are meeting on Aboriginal land at various Aboriginal lands across the state and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, tonight, we're really excited to have um, Steve Debus joining us. Steve's one of Australia's most eminent ornithologists and a particular expertise in raptors, the sort of large predatory birds of our continent. Um, Steve's going to be talking about their about raptors, but particularly about their threats and conservation sort of challenges in New South Wales. Um, as we, we all know, we're sort of so much of the conservation work that we get engaged in across the state is focused not just on habitats, but also upon those, you know, the species that rely upon specific habitats. Um, and while we can get a little bit caught up in thinking of them as just sort of an umbrella or a sort of an almost an analog for sort of conservation challenges, they're, they're also incredibly important in their own right as, as a critical part of our biodiversity. So really looking forward to hearing what Steve's got to say about, you know, the status of raptors in New South Wales at the moment. Just a couple of housekeeping things to, to kick off with, just to remind everybody that because this is a webinar, there's a couple of different ways that you can um, engage and, and ask questions. By preference, um, you if you just hover your mouse over the bottom bar of your Zoom screen, of your screen, you'll see on the right-hand side, there's Q&A. And if you write a question into the Q&A, what will happen is that um, towards the end of the, um, the webinar, that I'll pick those up and read them out. But if you've got things that you want to um, raise with other participants, um, more in the nature of commentary, I guess, rather than a question, there's also a, a button called chat, which is sort of in the bottom of your screen middle. Um, so feel free to use the chat just to interact with other participants. Um, so at the end, I'll also go through a little bit about what's happening in the upcoming seminars. But for now, I'd like to welcome Dr. Stephen Debus to talk to us about the Raptors in New South Wales. Thanks, Steve. Thanks very much, Gary. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'll just uh, get straight into it, I suppose, and um, run through the, the species we've got and, and why they're important and, and so on and get, get to the threats and conservation. So um, first up, um, oh, I should mention, I guess, that um, I'm an honorary at UNE in zoology, but I'm on contract to local land services um, to survey raptors as part of my job. Um, but anyway, on to the raptors and um, some reasons why they're important. Um, they're at the top of the food chain, so that makes them sort of indicator or sentinel species for what's going on in ecosystems. And their numbers and diversity and, and trends can signal the health of the environment. Um, and they can alert us to environmental problems such as toxins and pollutants and also loss of biodiversity. Um, Raptors need large areas of, uh, areas of habitat, and that makes them sort of umbrella species. And they've been used as umbrella species for conservation on the basis that um, um, good breeding populations of raptors are, uh, are in biodiversity hotspots. Um, and just on the meaning of raptor, um, it was originally applied to birds of prey, um, and it der derives from the Latin word for um, seizing or um, seizing prey and, and they're characterized by their, their talons for, for um, seizing prey and their hook bill for tearing. So they, they do their capture with their feet and they, they use their bill to, to eat um, their prey once they've got it. Um, so um, in New South Wales, we have um, among the diurnal raptors or um, daytime ones, we've got 24 native resident species. Um, there's several vagrants or rare migrants as well, but um, we basically have 24 um, Australian species and we've had all 24 recorded in New South Wales. Um, and most of them are here most of the time. Um, there's only a couple that are um, pretty, pretty unlikely to be seen in, in the state these days. Um, 
So we've got 18 members of the hawk family and order, the eagles and hawks and so on, kites, uh, they're in their own order and family, and they've been split off by DNA studies from the, the falcon family and order. So the falcons, according to the DNA, are more closely related to parrots than they are to the, to the hawks and eagles, which is quite interesting. Um, example of convergent evolution, I guess. I'm not really going to touch on the on the nocturnal or nighttime um, raptors, the owls, much, um, except to mention that we've got four members of the barn owl family in Australia and um, five or six members of the hawk owl family, depending on how you um, regard the Tasmanian and um, New Zealand boo books as, as separate or, or lumped. Um, the, the DNA tends to favour um, that there are six um, hawk owls if, if you separate out the, the regional boo books. Um, right. So I'll run through um, each species in turn, more or less by size approximately. Um, so um, if we start off with the hawks and eagles, we've got the wedge-tailed eagle um, at, at the top, I guess, in terms of size, it's a large vertebrate generalist and scavenger. It eats, you know, mainly mammals, but also birds and reptiles and takes carrion. And I'll just mention now at the start, because you can see the difference there, um, young birds of prey, um, they can leave the nest at the same size as the adults, more or less, but they're often differently coloured. So here you've got a, an adult wedge tail on the nest with a, with a a fledged juvenile on the right that's a much lighter brown um, standing on the nest beside its parent and, and you know fully um, fully adult in body size at that stage. Um, so moving on to the next one is the white-bellied sea eagle um, and I've got uh, the, where, where appropriate or where applicable I've got their um, official conservation status listed according to state legislation in the various um, states. So another example of um, juveniles being um, different in appearance from the adults, um, when they fledge, um, they're full size, but the, the young ones are not gray and white like the adults. They're brown with a white tail. that has got a bit of a black or dark tip. And then they go through this intermediate stage on the bottom right there, um, um, on, on the progression uh, in, in molts and plumage and so on to the adult condition, but um, uh, by about five years old, but um, that, that intermediate stage is going through sort of an osprey phase where it's got that band across the, the breast like an osprey, but it's got a, the wedge-shaped white tail um, like, like the adult. Um, and um, being a fish specialist, it mostly does eat fish, but also water birds and aquatic reptiles and it scavengers as well. And yeah, it's vulnerable in New South Wales and Victoria and Tasmania and endangered in South Australia and um, the, mainly because of the prospect of disturbance at, at nest sites um, by human activity. Uh, on to another fish specialist, and we've got the osprey, which is listed as vulnerable in New South Wales and endangered in South Australia, but it's been making a pretty good recovery in New South Wales and, and expanding southwards um, once, once it was um, helped with the artificial nest sites and protection and so on. Um, it's doing quite well now, at least in New South Wales. Uh, moving on to some related sort of generalists and pirates and scavengers that are sort of smaller versions of the sea eagle, I guess. Um, Brahmini kite is coastal and it's fairly aquatic. It does catch fish as well as um, things on land and scavengers and so on. Um, and again, illustrating that the juvenile on the right there is quite different from the adult. It's, it's mostly brown and it looks, looks quite a lot like a, a short-tailed um, whistling kite, which is the next one. Um, so among the generalists and sort of pirates and scavengers, we also have whistling kite, um, which likes wetlands, but also pretty widespread in open country. And it's a, a soaring um, hunter of small animals and a lot of carrion, it's a scavenger. And um, the one in flight there, pretty distinctive underwing pattern, but the one on the left with that white, white spotting is, um, is a juvenile. Um, um, and related again to that is the black kite um, with, with its characteristic fork tail. It's um, 
one of open country and, and particularly in the arid zone and also the tropics it's quite common up north and it's a soaring scavenger and hunter of quite small prey and the sea eagles and the, and the large kites they often um, rob food from other birds of prey as well or try to um, sea eagles particularly can pretty much rob anything they, they want to but by their size um, and then I'll move on to some sort of medium-sized vertebrate specialists. And um, we've got the little eagle there um, with its feathered legs like the wedge tail. It's a, it's a, a true or booted eagle like the wedge tail with feathered legs down to the feet. Um, and it's been listed as vulnerable in all the, basically the southeastern states, New South Wales, ACT, Victoria and South Australia. It's a woodland bird and it soars and it, it catches um, mammals, birds and reptiles, and particularly um, young rabbits in the southeast or the, or the south, southern Australia generally. Um, so moving on um, in that category and medium sized sort of vertebrate specialists, we've got the black breasted buzzard, um, which is a bird of the arid zone. It's an endemic, uh, so is it illegal. It's endemic to Australia now that, now that the um, New Guinea one is separate, uh, as a separate species. Um, so the buzzard um, is vulnerable in New South Wales and uh, it's related to the square tail kite, which I'll come to shortly. Um, um, so, oh, one of, one of the interesting things about the black-breasted buzzard is it uses tools to break eggs. So it picks up a stone and, and um, will land at an emu or busted nest and um, hurl the stone at the egg to break it open and eat the contents, which is, um, something one other raptor species does in, in the world, and that's the Egyptian vulture in, in Africa. Um, so it's uh, yeah, interesting bird. Um, um, coming down a size range a bit, uh, and still on the medium sort of vertebrate specialists, we've got the brown goshawk, which is a bird of forest and woodland and an ambush predator. Um, oh, I meant to mention with the buzzard, if I just flick back again, the, the juvenile in the, in the bottom right is differently coloured. It's, it's rusty brown or a rich brown rather than the full black, uh, black underparts of the adult. But anyway, um, onto the goshawks. And um, the main thing I guess there again is emphasising that the juvenile on the right can look very different from the adult. Um, so that was probably all I was going to say about that, except oh, being ambush hunters of woodland, of course, they've got short wings and long tail, and especially in the grey goshawk, which is a more dense forest, it still hunts the same way, but it's um, manoeuvring inside quite dense vegetation, so it's got the very broad wings. Um, it's listed as vulnerable in Victoria and Tasmania and, and endangered in South Australia because it's only just got a toehold in South Australia because there's only a little bit of forest in the southeast, um, so low population in South Australia. Um, um, oh, and its um, wing shape sets it apart from the grey falcon, which I'll come to later as well. Um, and then similarly in the same size range, uh, more or less, um, with longer wings and tail is the medium sort of vertebrate specialists that hunt in open country and sort of rank vegetation or over rank vegetation and hunting by sound because they've got that owl-like facial ruff. We've got the swamp harrier in wetlands and those two on the left show their characteristic white rump um, of that bird. Um, and we've got um, spotted harrier too, um, which um, has long legs for reaching down into the long grass. Um, and it's been listed as vulnerable in New South Wales, um, and I think near threatened in Victoria. Um, so it's a grassland bird, unlike the sort of, well, there's a bit of overlap, but, but wetlands is the swamp harrier's favourite habitat and, and grasslands in the drier country and crops too. You, you'll see them over tall dryland crops um, in New South Wales and elsewhere. Um, again, emphasising the difference in the juvenile bottom right there compared with the very colourful adult. Juvenile is more a sort of rusty brown that fades out to a sort of ginger colour over time uh, until it molts. And then and the adult is that blue, grey, and, and rufous underneath with the white spots. Um, 
Uh, now, a large bird specialist, which is about the size of a little eagle, is the red goshawk um, in the tropics. It's a, an ambush hunter like the other goshawks, but it's also um, very fast in the air. So it chases a lot of prey down in the air and, and, and can stoop like a falcon and so on. And it's a big bird, pretty massive feet. And um, it's been listed Australia wide as endangered. Um, or assessed as endangered Australia-wide anyway, and I'm uh, due for uplisting under the um, EPBC Act, um, or might be already listed by now. Um, the latest assessment, of course, was the Action Plan for Australian Birds 2020, which is not long out. And um, it's been listed in, as critically endangered in New South Wales for a few years now, but it's basically functionally extinct um, in New South Wales and Southern Queensland. It's retreated basically to its core range up in the tropics, you know, Kimberley top end of the Northern Territory and, and Cape York Peninsula. So it's one that has massively declined. Um, um, now, a small bird specialist is a collared sparrowhawk, um, again, emphasising difference there between the adult and the juvenile. It's kind of like a, a, a small version of a brown goshawk with some fairly subtle differences like the notched or squarish tail rather than the rounded one of the goshawk but um yeah it's a similar sort of woodland and forest uh, ambush hunter but it can um, dash out and catch small birds in flight um, and we move on to um a, a specialist on small foliage prey in forest and woodland that's a square tail kite it's another endemic um, it searches very slowly and methodically low over the tree canopy and, and takes small things out of the foliage. Um, a bit like an oversized Pacific buzzer, which I'll come to in a second. But um, the square tail has been listed as vulnerable in New South Wales, although it's, it's doing pretty well. It's actually in, increased on the coast and it's being seen, for instance, around Sydney and a lot of other coastal cities a lot more than it used to be. Um, endangered in South Australia and, and has recently been uplisted to critically endangered in Victoria, mainly on the basis of just the small numbers there. But um, it seems to be at least stable, if not increasing, and um, only got a toehold in South Australia because you know, its habitat is only restricted to the southeast pretty much. Um, so um, moving on. Um, oh, there's the Pacific buzzer, a very colourful um, hunter, uh, again, in the foliage canopy, but it, um, but it clambers around in amongst the, the branches as well as searching from the air and, and sort of crashing to the foliage to snatch insects, mainly stick insects and, and other things, cicadas and beetles and some tree frogs and so on. It's an insectivore, uh, mainly. Um, but, yeah, operating in the, in the forest canopy or woodland canopy um, and doing quite well and expanding southwards, probably with climate change, I'd say. Um, and then we come to some rodent specialists of open country. Um, so at the small end of the hawk family. Um, so a black shouldered kite there, you can see it's actually swallowing a mouse hole. They've got, they can do that. They, um, they their favorite prey now is nowadays is the introduced house mouse and um, forage is mainly in the daytime and it, it's, it hovers, you can see it hovering and then dropping into grass to um, snatch a, usually a rodent, particularly a mouse. Um, um, yeah, and they, they like fairly long grass, they can, they can dive into long grass and catch these things. Um, so its counterpart in the arid zone is the letter-winged kite. We, you, they rarely make it into New South Wales. They're sort of centred in the channel country of Western Queensland um, and they forage at night. Um, they hover as well, but, but like the black-shouldered kite, but they're um, rodent specialists often, often feeding on the native long-haired rat. Um, and they're more, more owl-like than, than hawk-like, I suppose, in some ways, because they've got the big eyes and nocturnal vision and, and so on. And, um, yeah. Uh, and it's an endemic, um, and yeah, it's it's one of one of the ones you don't really see much in New South Wales unless there's been a, a an eruption of um, long-haired rats, and then when the rat plague collapses, the kites move in search of food, so they can turn up anywhere. Um, so I'll move on to the falcons now. As I said, a separate family, and I'll start with the 
One's kind of at the base of the family tree. Um, we've got the Nankin kestrel, which is an insectivore and sort of generalist of open country. Um, uh, can take small reptiles and, and rodents and small birds and so on, as well as insects, but it, it eats a lot of insects, uh, grasshoppers and locusts and things, um, and which it finds by perching or hovering and then dropping into the grass. Um, prefers shorter grass than the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the black shouldered kite. Um, it is or was a common roadside one, but it has declined a bit, like most of our birds of prey. Um, uh, another one um, of open country, it's sort of a generalist, and a, but also a reptile specialist. It can eat a wide range of things, but it's particularly good at taking venomous snakes. Um, it's very variable in colour, so that you've got um, a, a sort of normal, moderately dark one on the left there. Um, and then in the centre, there's a very dark brown one, almost uniformly dark until it flies. Um, it's got the paler underwings and undertail of the barring, but it's got long legs and it's got that sort of blocky head and pot belly and sort of perching up on, on uh, almost vertical twigs at times. And in the, in the flight shots there, especially bottom right, you can see two examples of the extreme of variation in the one shot. The male would be the smaller white breasted one and, and the bigger one would be a female. Um, she may still be young because a lot of the um, dark birds are, are young. Um, uh, uh, it's nearly endemic, extends to um, New Guinea. Um, and um, oh, the, a bit like a black falcon, but, um, but different in flight because of the different colored underwings and the longer legs. And, and uh, we've got a small bird specialist, the Australian hobby, or what used to be called the little falcon. Um, it's a bird of sort of open sort of woodland and grassland, and, and you'll see it in urban areas. Um, and it stoops at prey and chases them in flight. It takes mainly birds, but also can catch flying insects and um, bats at, not, at, at dusk, um, insectivorous bats. Um, so yeah, it's an aerial hunter. It catches things in flight. Um, pretty fast chaser of things. Um, if I move on to a medium bird specialist in open country, we've got the grey falcon of the arid zone, um, an endemic. Um, like I said earlier, sometimes mistaken, um, well, grey goshawk sometimes mistaken and black shouldered kite sometimes mistaken for the grey falcon rather than the other way around because it's quite rare the grey falcon. Um, it's vulnerable Australia-wide, endangered in New South Wales and Victoria, and it's pretty much confined to the arid zone. I would, you wouldn't expect to see it outside the arid and semi-arid zones. Um, it's a, a fast bird chaser. It's pretty much specialised on, on birds um, as prey. Um, and then if we go to the black falcon. Um, it's probably most common in the semi-arid zone, um, although it will go into the arid zone in wet years when, when there's plenty of water and prey around. And it's appeared in coastal areas, particularly during drought, but also it has occupied the cleared coastal valleys up and down the coast. Um, but it is now vulnerable in New South Wales, listed as such, and Victoria and South Australia, because there has been a noticeable decline in recent times. Um, yeah, in flight, it's um, more uniformly dark than the brown falcon with, um, without the prominent pale barring in the wings and tail and um, usually more pointed wings. Um, and it's a fast flyer. That's, yeah, it can chase birds and catch them in flight. Um, I think that's about all I was going to say about that. I mentioned that it was endemic. Um, and then at the, I guess, the pinnacle of the falcons, if you like, is the um, peregrine falcon, um, medium sized sort of bird specialist um, of open country uh, cliffs and in the airspace over forest and, and around wetlands. Um, uh, it's been famous for the speeds it's been said to reach. Now in recent times with, with GPS trackers, they've, they've actually managed to measure flight speeds of peregrines at anything between when they're, when they're diving. Um, in a fast power dive, 190 to about 270 kilometres per hour. So that's uh, pretty fast for a bird. Um, 
and yeah, they, they take birds in flight, of course, and um, sometimes um, strike them in flight so that they fall to the ground and then they pick them up on the ground. Um, so that pretty much takes us through the catalogue of our um, birds of prey. And I thought I'd move on to some habitat needs for some of them, or most of them, in fact. Um, so in general, um, particularly the larger species, they, they require um, foraging space and large territories. I mean, we're talking hundreds of hectares or, or more, thousands even in some cases, um, and sort of freedom from disturbance, particularly when they're nesting. Um, the hawk family build their own stick nests in mature and old growth trees. Um, some species are forest dependent as well, like the goshawks and so on except for the swamp harrier, which nests in grassland and wetlands, it builds, builds a nest even on the water or, or amongst crops. Um, and the osprey will also nest, build a nest on artificial structures. You might've seen plenty of those on, on purpose-built platforms or even um, telecommunications towers on the coast and in dead trees. Um, but the falcon family adopt vacant stick nests of other species, particularly the hawk family and, and crows or ravens that, um, that are built in mature and old growth trees, or sometimes in artificial structures such as um, telecommunications towers in the inland. Um, but a kestrel and peregrine will also nest on cliffs in, and in tree hollows in old trees. Um, and uh, on ledges of buildings or mines or quarries. So they're, they're a bit more flexible. Um, and fairly adaptable, like the Kestrel and the Peregrine. Um, so, um, oh, I think I skipped ahead. Um, so that was the nesting ha habits and so on. So threats, I mean, uh, generalising, I guess, there's habitat loss um, of one sort or another. Um, land clearing, particularly for the forest and woodland dependent ones, and logging. Um, can affect uh, the species that nest in forests. Um, removal of paddock trees, um, which is you know, a result of relaxation of the clearing laws. Um, paddock trees are important. Foraging and nesting sites for some of the common farmland birds that would be preying on agricultural pests. Um, and then we've got land degradation in the arid and semi-arid zones um, by, um, I guess, mainly overgrazing and, and, and some clearing as well. Um, wetland sort of degradation, um, wetlands get drained and so on and, and uh, degraded in other ways. Um, pesticides and pollution, um, we, I guess we know the DDT story with, with particularly peregrine falcons and fish eating raptors and particularly overseas, um, but our species like the peregrine and sea eagle and osprey did get thin shelled eggs here too uh, in the DDT era. Um, now, that's one thing that's been very topical is the second generation anticoagulant rodenticides, those SGARs, um, which are the highly toxic and um, single dose um, rodent poisons that um, cause secondary poisoning in, in, in birds of prey that eat um, poisoned rodents um, because the rodents stagger around and are easy targets. So they get caught and eaten and then, then the birds of prey and owls um, get a fatal dose of um, those chemicals. Pindone used for rabbits, it seems like it probably affects little eagles and others that eat, eat a lot of rabbits. Um, organophosphate poisons, um, yeah, like mevinfos and, and something, oh, lucijet and so on. Um, and avicides used against pest birds in cities too, um, against starlings and pigeons and so on. They've killed a few peregrine falcons that try to nest on city buildings. Um, Persecution, it, it, it's sort of gone a bit underground now, persecution, it's because it's illegal, the shooting and trapping and poisoning, and the main victims these days have been um, wedge-tailed eagles, but there's a bit going on with peregrine falcons too by, by some pigeon fanciers and pigeon racers that don't like their birds being taken by peregrine falcons. And I guess I can understand them they're not being happy about losses, but... Um, they do release their birds in ways that sort of almost train falcons to catch them. So they've got to look into that aspect too as, as well, I think. Um, disturbance to nest sites. Now that's becoming an issue for large raptors and for coastal species like ospreys and sea eagles that are in the way, in, in the path of development, you know, urbanisation on the coast. But 
but photographers and twitchers can be a bit intrusive at nests too for you know at sensitive species um we've had episodes of um photographers and so on and twitchers at, at red goshawk and gray falcon nests that um have risked um harm to the, the young ones or, or the nest desertion and so on um and there's you know, collisions with human infrastructure like windows um sparrowhawks and and goshawks and falcons are particularly prone to window collisions when they're chasing birds um, and barbed wire fences the ones that fly fast at low level collide with barbed wire fences and do themselves a lot of damage when, when they hit a barbed wire fence um, and often fatally of course and it's also difficult to repair a bird that's been ripped up by a barbed wire fence even if it survives that impact um, wind turbines are large soaring species like wedge-tailed eagles and sea eagles particularly but also some of the others do come to grief um, by colliding with wind turbines um, and power lines. Um, power line collisions happen and of course vehicles. I mean roadkill is quite a common cause of death for birds of prey and a lot of and many other species. Um, electrocution um, is another cause because a lot of power poles, the configuration enables a large bird of prey to um, contact the wires with its wings when it's perching on, on, on the pole. Um, wildfires and, and too hot or extensive control burns can, can um, destroy nest trees and nests and, and young. And um, the last really uh, extensive fires would have wiped out a lot of habitat as well and reduced populations of prey and, and, and the predators. Um, sea eagles can get into trouble at fish farm offal dumps by getting covered in oil when they're, they're the, the fish oil when they're, when they're scavenging at offal dunks and it can render them flightless sometimes um, and all the coastal raptors can get entangled in, in discarded fishing gear like sea eagles and um, ospreys and brahmini kites particularly and, and sometimes whistling kites and that can even happen at the nest. Um, we had a case at the Bird Life Discovery Centre in Sydney there at Sydney Olympic Park where a um, parent sea eagle brought in a fish that had a hook in it and a young bird swallowed the hook and got caught in its esophagus but it also entangled its nest mate there was a brood of two they were also tangled together by the by the fishing line so it was a major rescue operation to to um, free them up um, and operate to get the the, the fish hook out um, lead poisoning from lead ammunition um, that's a common cause overseas and it's being identified in Australia is um, animals that have been shot with lead ammunition, if birds of prey um, scavenge on them, they can swallow you know, bullet fragments and lead shot and so on and, and get lead poisoning, which is quite debilitating and might be a factor in some of the other things like collisions um, if, if they're um, yeah, debilitated by lead poisoning. Um, there's a few cases arising in various raptors, including powerful owls and, and wedge-tailed eagles and, and sea eagles of beak and feather disease. That's that um, virus that uh, particularly parrots get, but it's thought that they might be coming in contact with infected prey, especially around cities where people are feeding um, parrots and things, where, where people feed birds. Um, that's a, a way of spreading the disease amongst the, the parrot population and, and then um, birds of prey that are feeding on, on urban parrots then catch the disease as well. Um, feral cats and foxes can prey on small birds of prey and um, grey falcons in the arid zone when they're roosting on the ground at night and um, owls, particularly fledgling owl, you know, owlets that are fledged but are spending time near the ground, they fall prey to foxes. Um, and there's a bit of interference competition at nests where there's abundant crows or cockatoos or ravens in, in inland areas where there's a lot of grain spill or where there's a lot of lamb carrion. Um, I've seen those sorts of birds um, interfere at nests, say of the black falcon, which is uh, a threatened endemic. Um, crows or ravens will eat the eggs of the falcons and the cockatoos will pull the nests to bits. Um, which the falcons can't rebuild because they don't build their own nests. They rely on a pre-built nest. So there's a bit of um, competition there, which humans have enhanced because of the food supply and population explosion of 
crows and ravens and cockatoos, uh, well, meaning sulfur presteds and, and um, mainly. Um, um, so moving on to some conservation actions. Um, so it, it's apparent that the focus should be on the large eagles um, because of their sensitivity to nest disturbance and so on, and the fact that wedge tails are persecuted as well illegally. Um, the arid zone endemics like the um, grey and black falcons and the endemic bird hunters, meaning, meaning red goshawk and, and those two falcons again, the grey and the black particularly. Um, we'd need more research, for example, on home range size and habitat use and dispersal and migration. We don't know a real lot about migration, but um, the work that's being done by telemetry and so on banding has established, for instance, that little eagles around Canberra spend the winter up in the tropics around the top end or the Gulf of Carpentaria or coastal Queensland and then come back to their nests. Um, so that has implications for their wintering range as well as their breeding range. Um, we need greater protection of breeding habitat and nest sites, including on farms, and I would include you know, remnant woodland and paddock trees in that category. Um, we need more large reserves in the arid and semi-arid zones um, and greater protection for TSRs, travelling stock reserves, because um, travelling stock reserves are often the best habitat that's left in a, in a heavily cleared agricultural environment. And um, it would be good to see an end to land clearing if, um, if that's possible. Um, we probably need a change of government to, to, uh, for that to happen, but anyway. Um, That'd be a, a, something to aspire to. Um, and control of feral animals and invasive grasses in the arid zone because things like camels and horses and goats and so on um, um, wreck um, natural water holes where some of these um, birds and their prey would be drinking. And also invasive grasses like buffalo grass burn very fiercely and destroy nest trees. Or I know of cases where there's been um, Buffalo grass fires that have taken out the old growth river red gums in, in, in the arid zone and, and destroyed nest trees of um, things like black breasted buzzards. Um, a return to the Aboriginal fire regime. I think uh, I'm sure the Indigenous people absolutely knew what they were doing with their fire and, and um, um, they've maintained uh, an ecological balance for, for thousands of years and we should be um, engaging their knowledge and practice to. Um, help uh, prevent the disastrous sort of fires that happen under the European fire regime and, and land management. And uh, I'd add uh, raptor friendly power infrastructure, which, which is possible and they, it can be retrofitted to, to increase the distance um, between the perches and, and the wires. Um, there's a lot of work being done overseas and in Tasmania about, um, about doing that, about making sure um, power infrastructure doesn't electrocute Birds of prey, but um, some of the other Australian states seem to be a bit slow on the uptake with that one. Um, although it, ospreys, they're, they're doing a good job with ospreys on power poles on, on the coast. Um, so I would suggest avoiding pesticides and particularly the um, these new rodenticides that contain um, compounds like brodifacum and bromodialone, which is a bad one, and diphenacum and so on. These are uh, worse than the old um, warfarin and, and or um, racumin, which contained um, cumatetrolol. So, yeah, look at the labels and try to uh, avoid the, these new ones if possible. Um, Non-lead ammunition. Um, there are alternatives to lead ammunition, and um, maybe. It, would be a good idea to have that mandated. Um, so I'd suggest maybe joining and supporting BirdLife Australia for those that haven't already. Um, they're doing a great job with bird conservation and, and raptor awareness and so on with their campaign against rodenticides and, and with the powerful our projects in three capital cities. And um, BirdLife also has a special interest raptor group, um, BirdLife Australia Raptor Group. Um, <laughs> So um, yeah, if people that are particularly interested might find that worth joining. And of course, citizen science has plenty of scope to report sightings and conservation issues. To, so there's the Atlas of uh, Living Australia or um, uh, BirdLife Australia's bird data or um, Raptor Watch, which is in 
in development at the moment by the by the Raptor Group, um, a, a citizen science um, bird of prey monitoring program is is still on the drawing board, but hopefully will be um, released in the not too distant future. And of course, you can always <clears throat> um, contact the conservation officers of the regional BirdLife Australia groups if there's any bird conservation issues and um, reporting illegal persecution or, or nest disturbance or illegal use of poisons, which are all criminal offences, um, particularly um, for threatened species, um, but all our birds of prey are protected by law. So any, uh, any deliberate actions against them are, are offences. Um, and uh, I'm just sort of finished by suggesting where people might see raptors. Um, and it de depends a lot on what species, um, you know, because they can be seen almost anywhere, depending on what, what, uh, what species we're talking about. But certainly rugged country with prominent sort of outlooks, if you're prepared to sit and watch the sky, um, coasts and wetlands and rivers have their suite of raptors. And um, vantage points over forests is a good way to see the forest species, particularly the ones that spend a fair bit of time hidden in amongst the canopy, but they will come out and soar um, and so on, particularly in the breeding season. Um, woodland on productive soils is pretty good for, for a lot of um, birds of prey, because um, that's where the prey is on the productive soils um, with good woodland. Um, grasslands, you'll see harriers and some of the open country falcons. Um, the edges and ecotones between habitats are, are good because of the variety of um, species, of, you know, prey species and others that you'll get there. And even in urban areas, like, like well-treated suburbs and urban green space um, will have the chance to um, produce raptor sightings. Um, so I think that pretty much wraps it up and, and uh, over to questions really. Um, so that, that's the end of the, uh, the PowerPoint. So. Yeah, I'm happy to throw it open. Thanks, Steve. That was wonderful. I've got to say, I particularly um, appreciated your overview at the start. There's such a difference between um, the sort of detail you provided and trying to work your way through all of those underwing patterns in whichever of your field guides you happen to uh, prefer. And um, yeah, I'm sure that there's many of us who have been stumped by um, trying to figure out whether it's a, uh, you know, a whistling kite or a little eagle, and um, yeah, that was that was really great. Um, one thing I just want to pick up on right from the start, you you made a comment about photographers and bird watchers uh, potentially disturbing nesting raptors, and um, as always, we encourage members to look at other organisations. And the one that Steve referred to, BirdLife Australia, has actually got some fantastic protocols not just for bird watching but also for their photography group and you know basically um, amongst their photography group they won't accept images of nesting birds you know it's a it's a it's a blanket sort of rule they have and that really reflects the vulnerability of um, any birds at that stage in their life you know we can we can all make a contribution by just taking that little bit of pressure off them um, Okay, look, I'm, I'm going to exercise the chair's prerogative in terms of um, questions and, and kick off with one of my own. Steve, you, you made a number of references to um, endemic raptors. I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if you could give us an indication of how important the Australian populations are of the more cosmopolitan species, you know, things like peregrines, mm. um, black kites. Um, I think the Australian osprey is a different species, isn't it? But, it, you know, um, but those, those species that have a bigger footprint than just Australia, how important is it for these, cons these species to be conserved in New South Wales and on, our, and on our continent? Yeah, I'd say that the most important one in that respect would probably be the white-bellied sea eagle because it yeah. extends just to Southeast Asia and um, I think there's there's not the level of um, uh, protection over there. I mean, people are obviously interested in Asia. You know, Asian countries are catching up um, with with sea eagles. They're, they're getting concerned about them. But I think um, yeah, black kites have got such a, a wide distribution that I think um, they're pretty much doing well everywhere. Um, um, there may be some local declines in in parts of Europe, but um, you know, they're very abundant in, in Asia. Um, Brahmini kites might sort of fall into that same category as a sea eagle because they're only extending to Southeast Asia. So our, 
Australia is probably quite important for that. Peregrines are, are global, you know, like they're absolutely worldwide except for Antarctica, and um, and they've recovered from the post um, DDT era, like they, they, they're bouncing back, and they're starting to do things in Europe like nesting trees again, which they didn't before because um, they didn't have to because you know a lot of the cliffs were vacant, and then, you know the few peregrines could find nest cliffs, but now now they're um, nesting in trees there as uh, um, stick nests in trees as they do in Australia now so but um, yeah peregrines are doing pretty well but um, yeah I, th I think Australia can still contribute to conservation of, of those global species on oh, the osprey yeah there's been debate about that the DNA work the most recent DNA work has come back to um, one global species oh, okay. um, osprey so ours is a regional subspecies that um, it's, yeah it's pretty much, uh, you know, Australia and um, New Guinea and um, some of the islands to the north. Um, so, yeah, that, that's, uh, yeah, we're back to one, one osprey species um, worldwide, yeah. And it's, it's, it's recovering quite well in, in um, New South Wales and it's probably still quite common in the other states except for South Australia where it's affected by um, oh, intrusions on cliff nests because they've got a nest on, on cliffs there so that any disturbance on, about the cliff top like four-wheel drivers you know puts them off the nest pretty regularly mm. um and of course they're, they're effectively absent from victoria and tasmania anyway it's not part of their natural range mm. anyway mm. okay thanks um all right so next question um is from biggles and uh if he was a shy and retiring type, his ears would be burning because we were talking earlier about, um, before the seminar, about his amazing raptor list for Centennial Park. But Biggles has asked whether um, poaching of raptors is an issue in Australia. And I'm assuming that's for um, poaching for the purposes of the falcon, falconing yeah. sort of pursuits, falconry yeah. pursuits, yes. Yeah, look, there, hasn't, there haven't been many cases that have come to light in recent times. Um, yeah, falconry is not permitted um, in in Australia. No, the, you know the wildlife laws. Um, well, the wildlife authorities won't grant permits for for falconry as a sport or a, or a you know a pastime or whatever. Um, partly because it would probably contravene other wildlife protection laws. Like you'd quite likely be taking protected fauna with them, and and um, it might contravene our animal welfare laws as well. So it's, it's not permitted as a sport, but most states and New South Wales seems to be the holdout on this one is will permit certain free flying techniques in raptor rehabilitation, um, not flying at wild prey as such, but just, just that sort of free flying technique to make sure they're fit enough to release again, if they've been injured and cared for. And just that's the fast flying ones like falcons and so on. Um, there's a few people that are pretty keen on using that method um, it doesn't involve taking live prey or anything but but the techniques get the birds fitness up um, but yeah look the, the the one of the one of the most recent rumors of poaching i did hear um, and that's going back a couple of decades now is that a, a certain person who learnt some trapping techniques from a from a raptor biologist misused those techniques to trap um, a pair of red goshawks, which may well have ended up in the Middle East, <laughs> um, because it, the Middle East is, uh, yeah, is a centre of falconry. I mean, it goes back thousands of years. I mean, you know, Arab falconers have been doing it for thousands of years, as, as have, you know, Chinese and, and um, other parts of, you know, the East, like Pakistan and so on. Um, and it's got a big following in North America and Europe and so on and, and other parts of the world. And um, there are occasional agitations for falconry to be permitted in Australia, but it um, seems like the sensible solution is to permit rehabbers to um, under strict, you know, sort of ethical and, and permit, um, you know, considerations and training and all that. Um, they, they can sort of feed that desire by, by using the techniques in rehab. And I, I don't think there's much underground falconry in Australia. There might be a bit, but probably not enough to affect wild populations. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, next question is from Scylla, and apologies if I've got the pronunciation of your name wrong, but um, who's observed that it seems that many, um, even common species like brown falcon uh, are still in decline um, and just asking whether that's the case. And I guess the issue is, is this part of the sort of 
decade to decade cycles we see in sort of abundance or is it actually a trajectory of decline across the board? It, it depends on the species, but it seems to be a bit of both. Like um, the, the measure we've got for New South Wales particularly is the New South Wales bird atlas, which continued the um, IAU one that was operating from 1977 to 81. They've continued it till 2006. And most of the um, raptors have declined. It, it looks like spotted harriers might have been cycling a bit. Um, they cycle a lot. Um, they, they'd be particularly that sort of bird. Um, some of the other ones seem to be on a fairly permanent decline, like brown falcons and brown goshawks and little eagles and so on. Uh, some of them, there might have been a bit of drought decline and recovery, like um, wedge-tailed eagles might have declined a bit and then recovered. And peregrines, a bit the same. Maybe they in the in the drought, they declined inland, but they they've increased on the coast. You know, so um, um, just want to think of of how the trends went for most of them. Now, there's a there's a few that are pretty stable, like sparrowhawks and hobbies. I guess because they can breed and catch prey in urban areas and um, Peregrines too, um, black falcons. It seems and uh, like um, yeah, basically environmental degradation of one sort or another in their habitat, like loss of you know riparian trees in in the agricultural belt and stuff like that. Um, and there are other other sorts of threats. Um, Grey falcons, uh, I'd say, probably have declined, but it's hard to get a measure of that because they're so rare anyway. Um, but you could infer it from the way they've. Um, responded to um, protection of habitat in the large arid zone reserves. Their breeding success has improved where their habitat has been protected and allowed to recover. And also where the rabbit Khaleesi virus knocked the rabbits and where, where then that enabled ecosystem recovery, now, their bird prey was able to recover, you know, grassland seed eaters and so on have recovered after the rabbits were, were um, knocked by the Khaleesi virus, so grey falcons, yeah, it seems like um, they probably have declined from environmental degradation in the inland. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Steve, can I take you in the other direction for a second then? There's yeah. sort of a, a handful of species that I guess as a local bird watcher, you may actually see increasing in your particular patch. And I, I know in sort of Southern Sydney, it's things like, you know, we now get to see osprey regularly, yeah. um, square tail kites, um, the bazza that we were talking about earlier. Do you see that as a, you know, a partial recovery from persecution or is this potentially the impacts of climate change starting to roll through? What's the, is, is there any real handle on what the dynamic is that sits under these, um, these handful of species where they're, they're at, Appearing in places that we just haven't seen them before. Yeah, it, again, depending on the species, it could be it could be a bit of both. I mean, I think ospreys recovering with a bit of human assistance and possibly climate change. Their, their prey may be becoming abundant further south because the ocean might be warming as well. But um, square tail kites, oh, they're so tame and confiding. They probably were shot in the early days, but their prey has also increased a lot. Like they. They like raiding noisy minor nests and, and nests of things like spotted doves and crested pigeons and wattle birds, which have all increased um, in coastal areas. Um, Bazas, it seems probably most likely just climate change. I think because they're a tropical species, I think they're just moving south with climate change. Um, so grey goshawks seem to be doing quite well, like they're at least stable or in, increasing on the coast. I, I see them on the coast quite commonly now, um, even in some partly open habitats, you know, you see them perching on power poles on, along coastal highways and so on. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, yeah, it could be, it could be partly lack of persecution, I think, because I think birds of prey are not generally, apart possibly from wedge tails, I think birds of prey are probably not persecuted as much as they used to be. Um, okay. But there's probably a lot of things operating there. Yeah. Yeah, as always, a, a complex and dynamic sort of picture. Um, question from Vanessa, who, who notes that um, rock climbers are very aware of the impact climbing could have on nesting raptors and they respect closures um, and, in fact, put in place closures. But it, she's asking whether there are measures other than closures, um, other ways in which climbers could help with raptor protection. 
Well, climbers, the main bird that's affected there is peregrine falcons because they're the mm. cliff nesters. Um, kestrels do nest on cliffs a bit, but um, they're probably also um, less bothered by people and certainly not as excitable and likely to attack people as peregrines are on a cliff. Um, yeah, look, I think with the cliff nesting peregrines, I think it's um, it's mainly a matter of just giving them their space when they're breeding. Um, I, I can't think of too many other things that would specifically help peregrines. There aren't really any others apart from kestrel that nest on cliffs in Australia. So I accept, well, well, actually South Australia is a bit of an exception because sea eagles and ospreys pretty much have to nest on cliffs there because there's no big enough trees for them along those um, coastal cliffs. So the main impact there seems to be four wheel drivers and um, on the cliff tops. So I guess, um, there needs to be uh, sort of some sort of engagement by the wildlife authorities with with um, recreational four wheel drivers to sort of pull the tracks back from the cliff top a bit and a bit of education to stop people um, flushing them from the nest because the the problem there is the flush distance. The you know the sentinel bird that's off the nest will see a four wheel drive and take off, and then the bird on the nest that's incubating or whatever brooding chicks will see that and then take off, and then. Yeah, they mightn't come back till the, the disturbance has gone, which which leaves the eggs or chicks vulnerable to the weather or predators or whatever. But that's that's a bit of an exception. Um, well, to the to New South Wales anyway. Um, so um, yeah, I think they're about the, the main comments I could make about cliff nesting. But but climbers, yeah, if they're doing wrong, I think there's not a lot else climbers can do. Uh, maybe lobby for. Um, control of feral goats because one biologist has mentioned that um, feral goats can interfere with peregrine nests a bit just by their presence, just by sort of, you know, swarming along the ledges and so on. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've got to say, I did once see a pair of peregrines drive a, um, a seagull into the um, sea when it went too close to their sort of coastal nesting area. <laughs> so I, yeah. I do wonder if the odd goat has gone off the edge as well. Um, Question from Lynn, which is, where's the best place to report illegal activity? I think you talked about the BirdLife um, regional offices. Um, and then, of course, there's always the Enviro line because yeah, EPA absolutely. often gets involved in poisoning issues yeah. as well. Yeah, or your National Parks Ranger, your local National Parks Rangers, or even, even the police if it's a, you know illegal poisoning, poisoning matter or something like that. If it's something pretty serious like you know involving firearms or poison, even the police really, I think, would be... Uh, yeah, possibly some under report too, but but yeah, uh, yeah ranges and and um, parks officers and yeah and Enviro Line whatever yeah. yeah yeah. All right, look, we've got time for one last question that I'm going to throw in. Um, we all know about wires and the sort of wildlife uh, rescue groups, um, and you know that's that's obviously all about rehabilitation. But in the sad circumstance where people see. Um, dead raptors, is there any value in bagging, freezing and sending through to the Australian Museum or any other institute for that matter? Absolutely, um, particularly, particularly now that there's a program to analyse um, bodies for um, poisons, toxins, like rodenticides and so on. Yeah, look, that, that's that's the best thing to do with a, with a specimen if it's in good condition, um, particularly, is um, bag it, freeze it and get it to the museum or, or, or you know, you, you know local national parks office they might freeze it can hold hold it until they can send it to the museum or um, um, you know a, a university um, zoology department or something like we've got up here at UNE we've got a zoology museum and and a freezer full of dead things um, yep. yeah which need need someone to process them but yeah 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 look it's a, it's a good reminder that conservation, doesn't stop with just protecting the live stuff. The, you know, the information yeah. that's embedded in every one of those organisms, you know, has a value beyond the immediacy, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Look, Steve, I just want to thank you so much for coming along tonight. It's been a really engaging, energetic talk. And um, I think you've seen from the sort of the, the response of your participants and the questions that have come through that people have really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for that. It's, it's sort of hard to do applause on this thing, but um, there is a reaction right. uh, option there. So I sort of encourage people to use that. Um, look, just to finish off, just want to note that this is the first of our new series of webinars. Really keen to 
um, see people along to our next. Uh, in fact, the next seminar in our series is being hosted by our Southern Sydney branch, uh, which is on Wednesday, 27th of April, uh, and they're getting a presentation on Komodo dragons. So um, the slightly bigger than our normal monitors monitors. Um, but look, thanks everybody so much for coming along tonight. Really appreciate your time. And I hope you've enjoyed this wonderful presentation by Dr. Deepest. Thank you. All right, bye all. Yeah, bye.